moments we're going to open with prayer we're going to give you the opportunity to worship through your giving uh, let me just say it is good to be here this morning it's good to be with each of you we want to thank you for being here if you are a visitor with us this morning we are certainly grateful for you hope that you will continue to join with us bring your family bring your friends we'd just love to have everybody here at the Manchester Church of God we're grateful for you this morning if you have a need before we go to prayer if you just have a need that you just want to Put before God this morning, just lift your hands, you know that you have a need that only he can answer, and uh, we just want to pray with you this morning, believing in the fact that he can do whatever we ask. He's a powerful, powerful God, and he can do whatever it is that we desire. Whatever we need, he is the answer. So this morning, if you will, let's just bow our heads, let's just go to him in prayer, let's just give him 
the reverence that he deserves, let's just give him the praise and let's just pray him into this place. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are grateful this morning. Father, we are thankful for this day. We're grateful that you have directed our path this morning that we might, we might come together and we might just worship and serve you. Father, we praise you for the God that you are. We thank you that you have allowed us into your family through the blood of Jesus Christ this morning. Father, we thank you that we are always on your mind and you want the very best for us. We thank you, Father, this morning that no matter what we have done, we can turn our lives around, we can come to you and you will accept us. We praise you, Father, that you continually forgive us of those things which we have done against you. We thank you for the opportunity to do just that this morning. Father, forgive us of those things that we have done against you, our iniquities. Father, bad habits, help us to break those this morning. Father, we give you every right to do a work in us this morning. We ask you, we beg you to do a work in us this morning. Father, that you would change who we are, that you would make us who it is that you desire for us to be the life to live the life that you have set before us and that you have uh, given us life into. So we thank you for allowing us to be here this morning. Father, for the hands that were lifted. Father, for the needs of your people, and you know those needs, but we stand out, we stand up, we lift those hands, and Father, we just ask that you would touch and that you would just minister to the need. So Father, this morning, those who have needs of, of healing, those sicknesses, Father, we ask that you would touch and just minister to those people. Father, for those who are in need of finances, Father, there's never enough money. Perhaps we need a new way, Father, to provide for family. Father, we're ask, just asking this morning that you would, you would touch and that you would serve us, Father, and, and that you would bless us with, with those things that you desire for us to have. Father, for relationships, God, that need to be rebuilt, people who need to speak to one another, who have, who have not in, in years, Father, we just pray that you'd bring them together. And Father, we just always want to draw close to you and ask that you would, you would extend our faith. God, that you would touch us in, in such a way that we would just have, have a, a greater desire to know, to know you and who you are. And Father, just to walk and to live in your spirit. Father, this morning we are grateful for that which you have blessed us with. We're grateful for this wonderful life that you have given us. And Father, for the abundance. And we're just thankful this morning. And we just give back to you in the form of our tithes and our offering. We just ask that you would accept these things and that you would bless them to the glory of your kingdom. Father, we ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And amen. Good morning and welcome to the Manchester Church of God. We are so glad you chose to be here with us today. If you're a visitor, feel free to fill out a visitor card just so we can get to know you. August 11th is the Women's Fellowship Meeting at 6 p.m. There will be snacks and crafts. August 12th is Rebecca and Brandon Boyd's Baby Shower at 1 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. August 13th is the Red Book Hymnal Singing Service sponsored by our Senior Ministry. August 18th is the Kickball Tournament Young Adults versus Youth at the park at 6 p.m. You don't want to miss it. This is a great time for fellowship. August 25th through the 26th is the Leadership Retreat held at the Signal Mountain Campgrounds. August 27th is T-Shirt Sunday. We are still looking for smiling faces on our greeting team. If you are interested in being a member, see Cindy Gillum or Terry Fontaine. We are also still looking for two to three new people to rotate in and out on the pastor's council. See Pastor Petty for more details. Don't forget to follow us on all social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Now let's stand and get ready to worship. All right, you guys ready to enter back into some worship? You know, if you notice the songs that picked today, we're focusing on who God is. It's, you know, it's okay to sing the songs where, you know, I'm, I'm delivered and you know, one fine day I'll fly away and be in him, heaven with him. Those are fine. But today I just want to focus on this holiness. Would you stand with me to your feet if you can? Would you just raise your hand and just say, God, you are holy. You are awesome. And we stand in awe of who you are. And together we sing.
Shekinah glory that we've all read about and then that we've all talked about that we want. You won't find that in a place that doesn't revere him. He's holy. And he said to be holy for I'm holy. He's awesome. If he never did anything for you, he's still holy. He's still awesome. But I know he's done so much. I really want that presence. Do you want that presence? I just want to hear the church sing, Jesus, your name. Because Jesus, your name.
God, you designed the timing of how the earth rotates. God, you, you hung the stars. That reminds us of your intelligence and your power. And God, we also are reminded that you are holy. Oh, you are holy. We worship you. We worship you. We praise your name. We declare this day who you are lift you up and we praise you. We magnify the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. You may be seated this morning. Wow, what a great job by our worship team this morning. These guys always do such an amazing job. And I'm um, just so excited to do ministry with them. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Praise God. I want to talk with you this morning for a few minutes. No fear when God's fire is on the mountain. No fear when God's fire is on the mountain. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 12 through 17 I love this passage of Scripture. I love, I love this whole section of 2 Kings. I love to read about the prophet Elijah, Elisha. I love these guys. Um, I love what they do. I love how that they are so, um, that, that they believe in God even when all kinds of stuff is stacked around them and, and, and everything is against them. I love that. <clears throat> and... Um, I love this little story in 2 Kings chapter 6. One of my favorite stories, I have probably about 100, but it's in the category of my 100 favorite, you know. So um, let's read this this morning. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 4 says, And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, oh no, there's the prophet Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words, 
that you speak in your bedroom. Man, let's just stop just for a minute and talk about this verse. You're talking about people hearing everything you say. People hearing everything you say. We, there are days when we say things that we do not want anybody else to hear. And Elisha, the word of God says that Elisha hears what the king of the enemy, the enemy king, what he is saying in his bedroom because God has given him that ability. God has, God has given him that. And Elisha understands what the, what the enemy is doing because he hears them talk. That's what, that's what they tell the king. He hears what he says in his bedroom. <clears throat> when we're at church, we're always like, oh, it's so good to see you, Sister Sherry. So good to see you, Brother Jason. So good to see you, Bruce. Oh, it's so good to see you. I love you. I just want you to know I love you, all this stuff. <clears throat> and then there are days when we may, not, we may not be thinking that on the inside, right? There may be days where we're just not thinking all those pretty words and all that. There may be other things that we're thinking. And we may say that to somebody thinking that nobody would ever hear it. But let me, let me just say this. God knows everything that we say. He hears every word and he knows everything. He knows every place that we go. He knows everything that we do. There's nothing hidden from God. And there are times where the prophet, where God gives the prophet access to things that nobody else has. And in 2 Kings chapter 6, this is what's taking place. Verse 13. That's not what we're talking about today, but I, I really like that. It's just extra. It's a bonus. Don't you love it when you get a bonus? Verse 13 says, so he said, go. This is what the, the enemy king says to his people. He says, go and see where he is. Go get Go get the prophet Elijah is what he's saying. That I may send and get him. And it was told him saying, surely he is in Dothan. He's in this little town. Well, I don't know that it's a little town, but he's in this city called Dothan. And, he, and there he is and him. Elisha is there with his servant. And the enemy king finds out where Elisha is at. And so what the enemy king does is he, well, let's go on. Let's read verse 14. Verse 14 says this, And therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army. The Bible says that he sent a great army. He didn't send 400 troops. He sent a great army. So he sent horses, chariots, and a great army there. And they came by night and they surrounded the city. They surrounded the city. Nobody's coming in. Nobody's going out. Because right now, they have the city surrounded. I, I want us just to look at a couple of things here. One, that there's a great army. And when the enemy comes against you, he comes against you sometimes. He really wants to show force. And it's that he sent horses and chariots. If you're just going to get something done, you just send 200 troops. You send 400 troops. You send 500 troops. But when you send horses and chariots, there's a new level to the game that you're playing. Because the horses and the chariots mean that you're coming for war. That this is a, this is a war statement. And they send thousands of troops to this town that has no defense. Man, what a, what a, what a strong statement. And verse 15 says this. And when the servant of the man of God arose early... And went out. Can't you just see that guy? He wakes up and he goes, Ugh. he gets up out of the bed. He sits on the side of the bed, rubs his face a little bit. He goes, he goes over to the curric and he, he gets a cup of coffee, you know, and, and he, he walks out and he walks out on this balcony, you know, you walk out on, he walks out on this balcony and goes, oh, what a pretty sunset. I mean, pretty sunrise, you know, the, mount, the mountains are so pretty out here and wow, man, it's such a beautiful day. Great glory. He looks, and there are thousands of troops surrounding the city. I think probably what he did was he probably, in a very rushed manner, he probably drunk his coffee. 
Because he was like, if I'm going to do anything today, I'm going to enjoy this cup of coffee. He drinks this coffee. He goes out and he runs around the city and he looks and the city is completely surrounded by these people. He rose early and he went out and there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master. The servant comes back to Elisha and he says, My master, what shall we do? Verse 16 says this. So Elisha answers and he says, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now, let's, let's just stop real quick and think about this. Elisha has one person with him. It's the servant that we know of. He's got one person with him. There's two of them. There's a good possibility that there's 15,000 troops standing around that, that, that city out there. 15,000 troops standing around that city. And there's horses and chariots. I mean, this is a battle-ready army that's standing out there. And Elisha makes the statement that there are more with us than what's out there. Now, in the physical, there's two of them. I don't think that Dothan is going to protect the prophet necessarily when it comes to this massive army that's lined up outside of them. Verse 17 says this, And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Here's my prayer today. I pray, God, that you would open our eyes that we would see what you're doing. God, let us see what you're doing. Let us see what you're doing, God. Open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And he saw. Maybe we should just stop right there. Does anybody want to know what he saw? Man, this is the good part right here. And behold, the mountain was full. The mountain was full. That means that there wasn't a spot left. That means there wasn't a spot left. That means that it's like they, drove, they went to the drive-in they pulled into the drive-in, they tried to pay, and the guy said, there's no spots left. You can't watch the movie. There's no spots left. The drive-in's full. In this story right here, he says, the mountain was full of horses and chariots. What if we just stopped right there? Man, that would be pretty cool, wouldn't it? If God had, if God had brought an army of horses and chariots, and he had, he had 300,000 horses and chariots in the mountains. It doesn't stop there. It says this. Chariots of fire all around Elisha. Wow. Man. Here's what's going on. Let me just talk to you just for a minute. The devil doesn't like you. This story represents you. In a sense, you are either Elisha or you are the servant of Elisha in this story. And here you are, you're in this situation where you are doing the work of God. You're trying to do the work of God. You're trying to do the things that God wants you to do. You know what the enemy wants to do in your life? This is what the enemy wants to do. Is he wants to come against you and say, you know what? You cannot do this anymore. I'm going to stop you. And I'm going to bring something against you. And I'm going to, when I come against you, I am going to bring force against you. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to get you in a position where you cannot escape. What, where was Elisha and the servant at? They were inside this city, Dothan. It's not a huge city. And they're inside this city. And the enemy brings thousands of troops and completely surrounds that city. Not only troops, but they bring horses and chariots. And they bring a, an army that is battle ready. They're ready to go to war over one man. Let me just say this to you, the enemy, there are times where the enemy says, listen to me, I will not allow you to prevail with what you're doing. I will not allow you to prevail. And he will show up on your doorstep with a powerful threat that comes against you. A powerful threat. The devil doesn't like you. Matter of fact, he does not like any human because humans are what? They're made in the image of God. And his fight is with God, but we are in the middle of it. We're the ping pong ball that's getting thrown across back and forth the table. 
John chapter 10, verse 9 and 10 says this. Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Jesus said, if you come to me, I will, I will rescue you and I'll save you. This is talking about from your sins that you, will, that you will spend eternity in heaven is what this is talking about. What are we being saved from? We're being saved from hell, right? Hell is where you go if you don't go to heaven. If you don't receive Jesus Christ, your personal Lord and Savior, you're going to go to hell. So you, Jesus is saying, I can save you. I can get you. Out. I, can, I can stop you from going to hell. And then it goes on. It says this, and we'll go in and out and find pasture. Jesus said, I can save you, but also I want you to understand that when you are in a relationship with me, I will allow you to come in and out and, res and have pasture. He's talking about care. He's talking about provision, about these sheep. He's, he's using a shepherd's term here. And these people were shepherds, and so they would understand what he's talking about. Verse 10 says this. The thief does not come except the only reason, this is what he says, the only reason that the thief comes. This is, there's one reason. There's one, there's one method, there's one motto of the thief, and it is this. He only comes to steal. What does he want to steal? He wants to steal your peace out of your home. He wants to steal your mind. Anybody ever said in the last month, I feel like I'm going crazy. All right, everybody put your hands down. <laughs> no, I'm just playing. I was afraid to say that I was afraid everybody would come to the altar, right? No. He says he wants to steal. He wants to kill. It's, you know, there's a little bit of a progression here, right? He wants to kill. He wants to steal. He wants to kill. Those things that you love, those things that you enjoy, those things that mean something to you, he wants to take those things. Why is, why is the devil wanting to come against us because of God? Because he, we are God's creation and God loves us. What does the Bible say in John 3, 16? That God loves his creation, right? For God so loved the world, right? He loves his creation. So what the enemy wants to do is he wants to, he wants to kill those things that God loves. And so the enemy wants to kill the things that we love. Those things that we love, he wants to come against those things, and he wants to kill those things. So he says he's come to steal, to kill, and then he says this, and to destroy. That word destroy means to, that, that nothing is left standing. In the end, it's disaster. In the end, everything is burned. Everything is destroyed. Anybody ever known anybody who they got started when they were uh, 16, 15 years old? They got started in some drugs or some alcohol, some kind of addiction, some kind of something. They got started, and by the time they were 29 years old, they were abs their life was absolutely in, just in ruins. I've had some cousins who have went through that. I would think that most of us know somebody who's been in that. This is the plan that the enemy, everything, every, every person that, uh, should trust that person. Nobody trusts them anymore. They can't find any help. Why? Because they've ruined all those relationships. This is what the enemy wants to do. He wants to destroy. The Bible goes on and says this, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. John 10.10 10 speaks to 2 Kings chapter 6 in this way. The enemy has come to kill, steal, and destroy. He surrounded the city. But Jesus said, no, I have come that you would have life and have it more abundantly. So he will come against you. He will surround you with fear. He will surround you with some kind of fear. Oh no, wheel's coming off the wagon. We're not going to make it. The boat's going down. We're going to drown. Everybody's not going to make it. I'm going to lose everything that I've got. I'm not, this is not going to work out. That's not going to work out. Here's what the enemy wants us to to think, here's what he wants. Fear, put fear on me. Think about David and Goliath. Remember the story of David and Goliath? We know that story. What, what was that? What was happening in that story? Goliath would come out every day and say, come and fight me. And all the Israelite men would do what? 
Yeah, not me. Not me. I am not fighting that guy. And here's, the, here's what Goliath said. Here's what the, the Philistines said. They said, you send out one man. It was, it was all the marbles. Anybody know what I mean by all the marbles? It was all the marbles. You send out one man. He comes out. Goliath comes out. They fight. Whoever wins gets it all. But here's the problem. Israel didn't think they had a man who could beat Goliath. And so for days, they sat over there and they, they shook and they, they feared and they were just terrified. And the interesting thing is the God of all creation was the one backing Israel, but they could not grab a hold of who God was long enough to fight the giant. But there was a shepherd boy who stood up one day and said, my goodness, I was out in the field one day and a lion came in and tried to grab one of my sheep and I grabbed it by the beard and I slew it. And then there was a bear came in and he tried to grab one of my sheep and I grabbed it and I slew it. What is this? Philistine out here, who is this guy? He is no more than the bear and the lion. And so David says, let me go out and take this guy. You know what they did? They said, hey, let's armor this guy up. Let's, he, we know he's going to lose, but let's just let him lose slow. Let's put all this armor on him, you know. And David said, I don't need any armor because I have the Holy Spirit. I don't need man's armor. All I need is God. What did he say when he came out to meet Goliath? He said, you come at me with a spear and a javelin and a sword, but I come at you in the name of the Lord. Is what he said. There was no fear in David. He said, I'm coming at you in the name of the Lord. But here's what happens in life. Because we have sat there for so many days and Goliath has stood out there and cussed us and, and, and talked down on us and he has just demoralized us so much. What happens is sometimes we find ourselves kind of hunkered down and saying, I don't know how to get there. I just don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Why? Because fear is standing right in front of me. And the prophet Elisha is surrounded in Dothan. What about David and Saul? David runs from Saul for several years. And the thing that Saul tried to do to David is Saul continually tried to intimidate David. He threw a spear at him, missed him, tried to pin him to the wall. He wasn't throwing a spear at him just to show him how to throw a spear. He was throwing a spear at him to try to stick it in his lungs. What about Moses and Pharaoh? Moses kept going to Pharaoh and saying, hey, you got to let the children of Israel go. And what did Pharaoh say? I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. And they took the straw away. They, they did all kinds of things. And Pharaoh just kept tightening down and tightening down. This is what happened. The enemy always loves to take a little fear and put a little fear on us and says, I've got you now. I've surrounded you. I've captured your city. You cannot move. You can't move. I've got you. Isaiah 41, verse 10. The Bible says this. Fear not. What does it say? Fear not, fear not. I need somebody just needs to somebody just needs to take that right there in like a vitamin. They just need to swallow that and just ingest it right now. The Bible says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed. Don't be confused. Don't be confused. Don't don't there there shouldn't be a, a moment where you're saying, Oh, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. The truth of it is if you live in life. There are going to be times when you're going to be dismayed. There are going to be times where you're going to be a little confused. And you're going to be trying to figure out what to do. And he says, do not be dismayed, for I am your God. And I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Meaning, when he says, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand, meaning physically I am going to intervene 
in your situation and I'm going to show up and I'm going to be there and I'm going to change the things that are causing you trouble. So what do we do? We put our hope and our trust in God. Here's the interesting thing about 2 Kings 6. It would have been great if God would have said, Elisha, show him all the horses and chariots that I brought. You know, because the enemy brought quite a bit of arsenal out there. He has quite a bit of firepower. It would have been great because God could have brought 20 times the horses and chariots that the enemy brought. There's, there's no limit to God or what he can do. But the interesting thing is, is his horses and chariots are on fire. And the fire, fire always represents the presence of God. It represents, it represents the presence of God. We, we remember the burning bush, Moses and the burning bush. Moses is out there doing a little shepherding. He's got a call on his life, but he's just seemed like he's struggling a little bit to find where his niche is at and where kind of what he's supposed to be doing. Moses is standing out there with his sheep and he goes, What is that? There's a bush over there burning. Man, we're we're out here in the absolute middle of nowhere. I mean, he was. They were like on the backside of nowhere. And Moses goes over there to the bush. And he, he gets spoken to from the bush. Hey, take your sandals off. The Lord speaks to him. The angel speaks to him. Take your sandals off. Moses takes his sandals off. And there he gets his direction. But the bush represents the presence of God. The Bible said that the bush was burning, but it never burned up. I feel like about an hour later, after all that took place, the bush was steaming and it still had green, green leaves on it because the Bible said it never burned up. But it was obviously hot. Exodus 18, God descends on the mountain as fire. In Exodus chapter 18, children of Israel have come out of Egypt. They're out there in the wilderness, out in the desert. They're out there. And the interesting thing is God descends on the mountain and the Bible says that it, when he came down to the mountain, that it was that he, that there was fire that came and it represented God. Second Kings chapter 1, Elisha calls down fire on 50 troops. I don't know if anybody remembers this story. Pretty cool story. They come up to him and they say, hey, you've got to come with us. And he, he says, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing it. Elijah says, no, I'm, 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 I'm not in on it. And they were like, no, you've got to come with us. And then he, Elijah makes a statement, if I'm a man of God, pray fire comes down on you right now. Wham! <laughs> They're gone. <laughs> he just burned up 50 guys. They're all burned up, you know. And then the, the story happens again. He says, if, if I'm the man of God, fire going to fall. I'm, somebody needs to show up and say, oh, you're the man of God. <laughs> You're the man of God. Don't call down no fire. We don't need any fire. God led Israel out of Egypt. And by night, there was a cloud of fire. And there was a, there was a moment there where the Egyptians wanted to come against Israel, but there was a cloud of day. There was cloud by day, but then at night it was fire. And there was times where that fire not only lit their way, but it was their protection. And then there's Acts chapter 2. Jesus told the disciples over and over while he was on the earth with the disciples, he kept saying, I'm leaving, I'm going to be crucified, I'm leaving, I'm going to ascend to heaven. But when I go, the Holy Spirit's coming. I will send the Holy Spirit to you. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. What he, he, he tells them this multiple times, talks about it. On the day of Pentecost, 
120 are in an upper room. They're in there, they're seeking God, and the Holy Spirit falls. But when the Holy Spirit falls, the interesting thing is that there are, the Bible describes it as fire above each one of them. What does that represent? What did, what did that mean? Why could they have not just spoken tongues? Or, or why could they have not just prophesied? Why was it that there was fire above each one of them? What did the fire have to do? Why did God do the fire on the day of Pentecost? The fire wanted, he wanted us to understand that this was the real deal and that it is the real presence of God because it goes back to Egypt, it goes back to Elijah, it goes back to Elisha, it goes back to all these Old Testament stories when God is showing up and God's power is being revealed. Sometimes there is fire being poured out. And he says in Acts chapter 2, I need you to understand that I'm pouring my fire on people. That if you want the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is on you, it, I want you to understand that the presence of God is upon these people. Here's what I, two things. I want his presence. Josh said that, oh, to get holy is the it's the way to get into his presence. I want to be in his presence. And two, I want to see the fire of God. I want to see the, I, I just don't want to see, I just don't want to see just a, um, oh God, will you, will you just, will you just help my, my, my ankle? It's hurt a little bit today. Will you just help it? Don't heal it, but just help it. God, will you just move me just a little bit? God, just give me just a, no, 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 no. No, I'm, I'm, this is what I'm asking for, God. I understand. I read, I've read from cover to cover, and I understand that there are multiple times where you send your presence. There's over and over times where you send your presence, and you send your strength, and you reveal who you are, and you move back the enemy, and you open doors that no man can open. And God, I'm asking that in my life, God, that you would open doors that no man would open. And God, in my life, I'm asking that you would pour your fire upon me, oh God, and let your Holy Spirit fire be upon me. God, because day after day, the enemy surrounds me and the enemy comes after me and the enemy traps me. But what I understand is there is more with me than what is with him. So I'm asking, oh God, pour out your presence. God, I'm asking, oh God, I'm asking God when the enemy shows up and when the enemy says, I've had enough and I've come out against you and I've come to stop you, I've come to steal to kill and destroy oh that i could say god that you would open everybody's eyes and let them see that those that are with us are more than those that are with them oh god let me move me into that place god that i would see god what you're doing that i would see the greatness of what you're doing god beyond it, 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 it's, it's good that we come in here and we have a church service and, and our, our worship team comes up here and, and man, we got, we got a great guitarist, we got great bass and drums and vocalists and we got pianos, we got two pianos and, and we got all kinds of stuff. We could put more instruments on the stage. We got a violin, we got a ukulele, we could put all kinds of stuff on the stage. I'm looking for your presence. I'm looking for your presence, God. I, I, I'm, I'm always so amazed, and, and, and I'm, 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 I love what's happening in the services. I'm loving what's happening in the ministries, different places, different times in town, different places things are happening. I'm loving that, but here's, here's what I'm saying. I'm good to come in and experience the service. But oh God, let me see what you're doing. God, let, me, let there be a deeper place. God, where I see what you're doing beyond just what I'm seeing here today. Because the truth of it is, God wants to do more than just what he's doing in here this morning. Just to have a great service. Now he wants that. It's not that he doesn't want to have a great service. It's not that he doesn't want people together and to have a great children's ministry and a great youth ministry and all this stuff to happen. It's not that he wants that. 
But there is something else that he is wanting us to do, and that is for us to see him and to know what he's doing. The prophet Elisha said this, God opened his eyes that he would see. God, I'm praying today, open my eyes. That I would see what you're doing, what you're what you're doing with this church, what you're doing with youth ministry, God, what you're doing with children's ministry. Open my eyes because it's more. It's more than just what's showing up on a, on a Sunday night in there. It's more. It's about putting families back together. It's about taking broken lives and and putting. You know, yesterday we went and prayed for the schools. We went out and prayed for the schools, and we stopped at the cost center. Some people don't know what that is. It's where the kids who have behavioral problems. It's where they go. There's other kids out there, but one of the things the cost center does is they do kids with behavioral problems. And one of my thoughts was that these kids, they didn't get here just because they just, one day they showed up and they said, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to throw a spit wad across the room. But there is stuff back in their lives that they're wrestling with. And they're trying to figure out and they're trying to get straight. And they're in the process of trying to wrestling with that and get that straight. Sometimes there's there's issues with authority and there's issues with all kinds of behavior and different things. And it gets them in trouble. And what I want to see is, I don't want to just see that we just have good music for our kids. But I want to see that people are set free and people, the chains are broken beyond just things that I can do on my own. But I want to see God move in a great way. Josh, would you come this morning? Oh, that I would see what God is doing beyond. The prophet said, God, would you open his eyes and let him see? Let him see that those that are with us are more than those that are with the enemy. The story goes on like this. Prophet Elisha walks out there. He comes out of the city. Elisha comes out. And when he walks out of the city, the army has circled the city. They've got enough troops, probably several deep horses and chariots, circled the city. Prophet Elisha says, God, I pray you put blindness on him. And every soldier goes blind. And the prophet leads them into the city and feeds them. That's that's an interesting thought. Leads them into the city and then feeds them. God, help me. Help me, God. I, I get stuck with just enjoying a good service. Sometimes I get stuck just in enjoying the, the, the stories from Children's Church. Sherry tells me weekly, oh, we had a good service today. Oh, the kids, we had, we had nine kids come down and pray this morning. We prayed about this. We prayed about, you know, sometimes it's about praying about puppies. You know, cats and stuff, you know. Cats not eating good. I just want to pray for my cat. Sure, let's pray for your cat. That's fine children's church you're going to pray for dogs you're going to pray you know pray for stuff you know we're going we're going to I love hearing the stories I, I I I walk through the youth at Sunday nights kids are running all over the parking lot they're laughing and playing I asked Lily and Levi on the way home I was like hey what happened tonight and they say we had a we had a good service. I always hear, I always hear a good report. I always hear a good report. I'm, I'm good with that. I want that. That's, that's what we want. But I also, Prophet Elijah, God, open his eyes. Let him see. God, let him see what I'm doing. Oh, God, I want to see what you're doing. God, help me. Help me, God, that I wouldn't fear when the enemy surrounds me. God, when everything, when, when there's no escape, I, 
I grew up in the country. We did a lot of hunting and fishing. When I came home, when I, from probably when I was nine years old to probably 15, when I came home, I grabbed a fishing pole. If it was warm, we went, we went and fished. There was a farm back behind us, and a guy had stocked bass back there. I know we weren't supposed to be back there, but I caught bass. We always threw them back. I caught bass every day. I stepped on more snakes than I could count. We, we shot rabbits in the winter. We hunted rabbits. Dad had rabbit dogs. We hunted rabbits. We shot squirrels. We shot some deer. I never shot turkey until I came here. We never had turkeys. Wild turkey. If I was in Dothan and the city was surrounded, old country boy would be trying to figure out how to get out of there. I'd be looking for something, putting my hand, some, maybe something to, to get out of there. But Elisha didn't say that. He, had, he never said, my experience is going to get us out of here. Because what we do is when we, we, we fall back on our training, we fall back on our experience. That's what we do. That's how we handle problems. That's how we handle life. We fall back on our training, on our experience. This is what Elisha said. God, open their eyes. Let them see you. Let them see what you're doing, God. God, will you give them just a glimpse of what you're doing? Oh, could you imagine being that servant? And that servant walked out there. And he put his coffee cup down. He said, I ain't taking coffee out there this time. He walks out there and he goes out on that balcony and looks out over. And he, the army's still out there. They still... But then he looks up just a little bit and the mountains are full. Couldn't get one more chariot in there. Couldn't get one more horse in there. There's no room for anything else because the mountain is full of horses and chariots of fire. Hey, somebody's right. There's an angel on that chariot. All it would take is one angel with a horse and chariot of fire. Just take one angel to come through there and undo all that, the, the, the Syrian army. Just take one horse, chariot of fire, and an angel. Just take one. But God said, here's what, I want you to see how I've got you backed up. I want you to understand I've got your back. I want you to understand that I've got you covered because I have brought enough horses and chariots and angels of fire to fill the mountain. I've got you covered. I've got you covered. He wants you to know that. I need to know that he's got me covered too. I want to see what he sees. Can we stand this morning and can we, can we pray that? You may be in one or two boats. You, you may feel like there's somebody here this morning. You may feel like the enemy has just surrounded you. You may be speaking the word of God and everybody around you is saying, shut up. Everybody around you is saying, don't want it, don't want it, don't want it. You may be speaking the word of God. You may, you may be trying to do what's right. You may be trying to make right decisions and everybody around you is just, they're just making wrong decisions. And you're, you're trying, you're trying, and you feel like that servant of the prophet of the Lord enemy's got you surrounded no <laughs> God's got you surrounded but we need to see that we need to see it we need to see it or maybe that's that's the fear thing maybe you're just you just need that maybe the Holy Spirit's calling you into that deeper walk and saying I want you to see what I'm doing I want you to get a picture of what I'm doing I need you to see what I'm doing as a church, as a church, God, help us to see what you're doing. It's more than just a church service. He's doing more than just a church service. It's more, it's more than just a good children's program, good youth program, good music program. We've got those things down. Those are in the books. Oh, but the Holy Spirit's wanting to do ministry. Oh, he's wanting to impact this town. He's wanting to change the culture. Can we pray right now? Pray with me. Father God, I come to you this day. Father, I come to you and I ask, oh God, the enemy has me surrounded. Help me, God, 
not to fear. Help me, God, to be like David when he went before Goliath. Help me, God, that my words are, I come to you in the name of the Lord. I don't come to you with a spear and a sword. I don't come to you with, with battle experience, but I come to you in the name of the Lord. All I have today is God. I don't have a sword. I can't use a spear. But all I have is God. Oh, God, help us. God, those that are surrounded. Those that are surrounded, God. Oh, let them know that you are the one that surrounds them. Right now, Father, I pray, if you're surrounded, let go of the fear and grab a hold of the hope because he is with you. Maybe there's some here today. There's some in and the Holy Spirit is leading you into a deep walk. You enjoy the church service. You enjoy the ministry. You enjoy doing helping people and doing stuff. You enjoy that. There is something deeper. Oh God, let me see what you need me to see. God, will you show me what you're doing? God, will you reveal some things to me, what you're doing? God, will you show me, God? what you're doing it's bigger it's bigger it's bigger than what I thought it was oh God help us this morning help us this morning if you need prayer these altars are open we want to pray with you Josh sing that for us we want to pray if you're here you can say Pastor Petty I need prayer this morning So 
Barbara Walker's grandson, his name's Brandon, he's got colon cancer. A few years ago, what's it been, about five, six years ago? 14, okay. 14, I was close. I was multiplying six times six, I mean six times two. Um, and he had leukemia. He can't do any more treatments. Yeah. All they can do is surgery. They found a mass in his colon. Would you just stretch your hands this way? And could we just believe in the good hand of God? Because I believe in who God is. I know that he opens doors. We want to just make sure that he knows God. Would you help us pray this Father, right now in the name of Jesus. Right now, Father, we come right now. We pray over Brandon. Touching God. Healing in his body. God, there are days when the doctors can't help. There's days, God, that medicine reaches its limits. God, but there's never a day when your resources are limited. There's never a day, God, when you cannot open a door that no man can open. Today, God, I pray, bring healing in this man's life. Touching, God, I pray over Barbara and Bruce. Touch Barbara, Lord. Oh, that she would stand in the gap. Oh, God, I pray Brandon would see you and know you, God, that he would understand what it is to know God. Oh, that he would see you. Open his eyes today. Oh, let him see you, God. Oh, we worship you and praise your name. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. You're going home to die. We can't get a perfect team. And I remember Sherry praying so strong with me. My daughter calls me the next day or two and she said, Mother, there's a lady I work with. And her husband's a minister. And they're going to Kentucky to a revival. And I want to take this prayer request to Kentucky. She, she said, Mother, you know that she told me there's no more faith in in Kentucky than there is in Tennessee, but we're taking it just the same. And so the lady took the prayer request to Kentucky for the revival for her, for their husband. And the last night of the revival, it was a, it was a black church, and the last night of the revival, she said, a black gentleman come into the back of the church and sit down. And she said, I saw him sitting there. And she said, I went to the altar and I was praying, and I had told no one what I was praying for. Said the black gentleman come up and touch me on the shoulder. He said, he said, ma'am, God sent me by here to tell you one thing. Today what you're praying for is going to come to pass. So my daughter calls me and she said, Mother, what do you think of this? What do you make of this? I said, I make of this the same as your father. God sent him, it will come to pass. Amen. Two weeks later, my grandson got the perfect ten from a guy across the ocean. Yes. What a story. And I'm hanging on to that belief. Killed him back then. Told him he'd have 10 years. He lived 14. He's got an 8-year-old son. They said he'd never had any children. God is good. He's merciful. His prayer has been answered in his church. That's what we're going to do it again. And thank you for being in here to pray again. Amen. Amen. God opens doors no man can open. I can testify to that. I've seen it. I know it happened. Amen. It's one thing to read it, to read the stories in the Bible and say, 
man, that's a really neat story. But when the Holy Spirit speaks to you and says, this is what I'm doing. And I mean every devil in hell fights you over it. And I mean, they, there's just a battle for maybe two or three years or five or whatever it may be. There's a battle going on for that to happen. And you struggle to hold on to it. You struggle to believe it. But somewhere in there, one day that door opens and the Holy Spirit says, this is me, I'm doing it. I'm telling you, that's happened in my life. God has opened those doors that, and the devil would, would tell me every day, it's not going to happen, you're not there, you'll never be there, you can't do this, you can't do that. But the Holy Spirit, I'd go back and pray and the Holy Spirit would say, yep, I've got it, I've got, don't worry about it, i got it. And I'm saying, I can't see it. You don't have to see it for him to be doing it. Amen. Amen. But I know this. When he opens the door, sometimes it's powerful. There's days when it's, it's powerful. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Youth service tonight. Prayer service here. I want to thank all those that came yesterday and prayed with us. We went to all the schools or we went to all the schools in Coffee County, right? And um, we prayed over Yep. We prayed over schools. And I want to thank those who came and, and uh, prayed over schools. The schools is a is a battleground. Um it is a battleground. And um we need, we need people praying. So if you think, you drive by one of these schools, you go by East Coffee or North Coffee or uh, Westwood Middle or one of these schools, it's okay for you to just put your hand up or whatever you want to do and just say, God, I pray for those teachers and I pray for those principals and I pray for those students and pray over those, pray over those schools. Man, they need prayer. Uh, we've got good, there's a there's a busload of good teachers and good administrators in this county, in the city, in the county, and everything. There's a lot of good students, but there still needs to be prayer. Uh, we still need to be praying for them. Amen? Amen. I just, I believe God wants us to, uh, it, it's a great, just a great place to, to pray over. Amen. Amen. Um, Richard Bagley, won't you pray over us as we go this morning?